So welcome back to Heroes Next Door. We are in the process of Corona and staying at home. And because of that, many of us have these honeydew lists that we're trying to get done. Cutting the lawn, making sure uh, we're painting the new house, or painting our rooms, we're doing some renovations. And season three of 911 WTF Moments gave me a small glimpse of what's coming up in the episode. And they have an incident where a guy gets shot in the chest with a nail gun. So we're going to review that and, and see how realistic it was, were the right treatments, and what else can we do? What are the other things that we need to be aware about? Uh, you know, accidents happen all the time, and this is one that, you know, could happen to us. Uh, so let's take a look. So right off the bat, it looks like the dad and the daughter are uh, working on a project. It looks like they're putting up a new wall. And in this, they're using an automatic air gun. The nail guns that we have nowadays have a lot of safety features on them. They have safety catches, so in order for it to fire, you actually have to depress the end of it in order to get it to fire. But many people uh, remove those safety mechanisms, and this is the reason why you shouldn't do that. You know, the daughter's holding it. She's um, being told how her by her dad to, you know, be careful. And just as that happens, boom, he gets shot. A shot right in the chest. And looking at it, I'm a little leery because the nail that uh, is portrayed on the show is about two and a half inches outside the chest. In order for that to actually puncture into the chest, a couple things have to happen. One, it needs to be much longer, you know, maybe a, a six inch nail or, or uh, something like that. And it needs to get between the pleural spaces. Did it go through the bone? Was it strong enough to actually go through the bone and into what they're portraying as possibly the heart? And as they come in, they do the right thing. They immediately go to whatever the tool was and turn it off. So they secure that, just like making scene safe for us. That's exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, the next guy comes in and he takes a look and he actually exposes the wound. Perfect, that's exactly what we wanna do. Scene secure, expose the wound and see what you're dealing with. They see a nail right in the middle of the chest. Um, and think of anatomy, that's right where it sits, that's where it's gonna hit, you know, maybe that right ventricle or that left ventricle, depending on, on where it placed on this guy, um, could be very, very serious. So as they're doing an assessment, they do a couple different things, expose it, they stabilize it using some gauze, uh, and then they notice during their vital signs that she, he's starting to get some JVD, jugular vein distension. What that means is the blood's starting to pack back up. They are um, getting fluid that's around the heart that's causing that heart to be stressed uh, and causing it to back up. So how do we treat this guys? Well there's a couple different things that we need to be aware about. One we're going to leave it there. We're not going to treat that in the field otherwise and stable it and get them to the hospital. Right? They do need to get a pericardial centesis done. Ah, hard word to say. But basically they need to drain uh, the fluid around the heart. So whether it punctured all the way into the heart or it's just a sac we're not going to know that. That's up to a surgeon to figure out. So they stabilize it. They get him on the stretcher. The guy's talking. They listen to lung sounds. He's got bilateral lung sounds. So at that moment in time, they know he doesn't have a collapsed lung. Think about the anatomy that's going on. You have, you know, two sets of lungs. On the run side, you have three lobes. On the left side, you have two lobes plus the heart, because that's where the heart takes up that space. Fortunately, he didn't need to have a chest decompression, but what if he did? Maybe he missed the heart and punctured a lung and he has a pneumo. How do we treat that? Well, if you were some of the old timers like myself, we had 14 gauge needles. And these were special needles because they have a, the ability to remove the back so we can hear the air coming out. And you take a big long needle like this and you puncture into the chest. That looks about the same size as that nail, right? So this actually goes all the way down to the hub in order to go into the pleural space. But us old timers realize that this needle actually isn't even long enough. So that nail has to be this plus whatever goes into the pleural space. We've actually been able to switch over to different needles. Uh, and I'll show you here, the needle size that we use nowadays is much longer by an inch at least compared to the other needle. So we'll take these two, hold them side by side, and look at the depth, the distance between those two needles. This one is done or given to us by American Northern American Rescue. Uh, excellent company, so if you need decompression needles, go check them out. 
But this decompression needle goes between the second intercostal space, uh, just midclavicular on either side, and that's where we're going to do that. Or you can go mid-axillary in the fifth intercostal space. For that mid-axillary one, maybe a shorter needle. These are both 14 gauge needles. Very important tools to have. But in this case, uh, he did not have a collapsed lung, so they didn't have to worry about that. But they start getting him to the hospital. They load him on the stretcher, get in the ambulance, they do their full assessment. They give him an IV for pain medications. They're starting to put on the EKG. Why is an EKG important for this kind of injury? Well, if you're starting to have cardiac tamponade and that sac is getting filled up full of blood and it starts compressing that heart, one of the first signs that you're in trouble, other than that JVD, is going to be cardiac dysrhythmias. And that cardiac dysrhythmia comes across for them as V-fib or VTAC. I would say that was more of a VTAC with a pulse because the guy was still talking. Um, how do we treat that? You know, we really think about the, these treatments. We're like, okay, well, I'll defibrillate that if he's symptomatic. His blood pressure drops, uh, he altered mental status, um, and those kind of things. We would normally defibrillate that or cardiovert that if he has a pulse, right? So he goes unresponsive uh, and it goes into straight V-fib. Can we cardiovert this with a nail right in the middle of the chest? If not, how would you do that? We're going to put the pads on where normal, right? But if I have a, <laughs> a, basically a piece of metal that's conducting electricity right in the middle of the chest, if I go to defibrillate, whether I'm using biphasic or uh, monophasic uh, technology, it's still going to go into that nail that's metal. It's definitely put your foot on the gas and get to the hospital, but can we use something else? What is ultimately the problem? Is it the fact that he the container is broken and he's bleeding and we need to fix that? Or is this truly an electrical problem that we use chemicals for that? Can we use a amniodarone, a lidocaine, or something like that in order to treat this? This is an excellent scenario that uh, many of us could use in our training days. Once again, 911, excellent job. Appreciate it. And take a look at it. Thank you for watching. And if you like what you see, subscribe.